Hi guys, I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, my, some of my dissertation work with uh, drought tolerant Brady rhizobium. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about why uh, inoculants are important, um, kind of how we found this drought tolerant uh, Brady rhizobium, uh, how we took it from the field uh, into the lab and then kind of back out into the field. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and begin. Uh, this first picture here, it's a comparison plot uh, from one of our sites in the Boot Hill of Missouri. Um, so here on the right, you can see uh, a plot treated with our TXVA uh, drought tolerant inoculant. On the left, we have uh, an untreated control. Um, so what, what is the difference here? Uh, to, look at the, to look what's really happening here, we kind of have to look uh, at the rhizome. So we have a, a sectioning of a root segment and if you focus in on these uh, small little oval things, um, I'm gonna blow it up and it, those are called nodules. So they're about half bacterium, half plant. Uh, and and that's, that is really gonna be the highlight of, of the presentation today is, is this, these nodules. Uh, so what's occurring in these nodules? Um, that's where biological nitrogen fixation occurs, uh, where the organism fixes nitrogen for the plant. Uh, so Brady rhizobium uh, are gram-negative soil-dwelling bacteria that form an eco ecologically important symbiosis with the soybean plant. Um, so the bacteria differentiate into bacterioids uh, whenever they infect the plant root um, and they form nodules. Um, these nodules are where atmospheric nitrogen gets fixed to a biologically active form uh, of ammonia. Um, they exchange this to the plant with, uh, for carbohydrates from photosynthesis. So inoculants of Brady rhizobia are typically used to enhance production of leguminous crops, such as soybeans. So before I dive into the, the super nerdy nitty gritty of the bacterium itself, uh, why, do we, why do we care about biological nitrogen fixation? Um, well, it benefits sustainable agricultural practices and it protects our environment by mitigating the need for manufactured chemical synthetic fertilizers. Um, so they're expensive to produce and they present a potential harm to the surrounding environment um, by providing nutrient abundance to very nutrient limited systems. Um, excess runoff can cause eutrophication events, uh, which drive harmful algal blooms and damage native, uh, native ecosystems. Uh, a lot of you guys have heard about the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the size of it is debated yearly, uh, but, but I've heard uh, it's about the size of Rhode Island. Um, so when these, har these harmful algal blooms happen, they, they thrive off the nutrient abundance and literally suck all the water out of the, uh, suck all the air out of the water. Um, so you can have massive fish kills. Um, they can produce uh, some toxins that can then go on to damage some of the, some of the ecosystems around the water. Um, and I don't know how many of you guys are from Texas, but last year uh, there was a lot of dog deaths down in Austin uh, from a cyanobacterial uh, algal bloom. Uh, and while not exactly the same as the algal blooms here, uh, they work around, along the same principles, uh, excess nutrients and, and, and a lot of heat. Um, so, so these are bad, um, but fertilizers are necessary, right? So with our increasing society, we, we are growing so much food. Uh, we're taking so much out of the soils. We have to put something back. Uh, so nitrogen is one of the macronutrients for crop production. Um, and, the, and the fertilizer consumption is steadily increased with our population growth. Uh, the production of, of fertilizers is really where the issue lies. Um, production via the Haber-Bosch process, it's really energy intensive. Uh, they are usually found around natural gas uh, deposits because that's the energy source that they use to break the dinitrogen bond, which is a very, very strong bond. Um, and then since they rely on those fossil fuels, they're just inherently non-sustainable in nature. Um, so, you know, we should try and get away from these as much as possible. But, but why soybeans? Why are soybeans so important? Uh, well, you ask the farmer that and they're going to tell you money. Um, they are the second largest cash crop in the United States. Uh, they have the highest price per unit volume, which is uh, a bushel. Um, in 2017, 60% uh, of, of our soybean crop went to exports which brought $28 billion home to the American farmer. Um, and that's just, that's fantastic. Um, you know, so other than these financial uh, incentives for growing soybeans, um, there's actually also an environmental incentive too. Um, they rejuvenate marginal soils. 
so uh, soybeans not only fix their own nitrogen, um, but and keep that in the soils for other crops so that farmers can use that in crop rotation with corn or sorghum um, so that the, then they then they have to use less fertilizer for their for their next crop. Um, but not only that, they, the roots are so strong, they will actually dig down into clay blocks and, and kind of provide a natural tillage for the soils, uh, allowing nutrients that have seeped off of the, the top layer down into the bottom soils and kind of bring that back up. Um, so that's why farmers really like to use them in their crop rotations. Uh, sometimes they even use them as a green manure. They'll plant a cover crop and then just let it grow for a little bit and till all that stuff up under. Um, it really, really helps their soils. Um, so, but, but why are soybeans worth so much? Uh, well, it's really just because of products that can be used from them. Um, I, I don't care if you, if you snuff your nose up at tofu. Uh, I did at one point, I've, I've learned to like it um, through, through <laughs> experimenting in the kitchen with it. Um, but, but some people don't like it and that's fine, but, but there's so many more products that soybeans can, can yield than just tofu. Um, you know, I mean, from, from foods, from flour, uh, to the whole products such as fiber, um, soybean oil, a lot, of, a lot of our food is cooked in soybean oils, um, protein products, isolates, uh, and then actually uh, uh, a lot of makeup and cosmetics are based off of uh, some soybean products. Uh, so there's probably a lot of products that you, you have in your own home and you wouldn't even know, but they're based from soy, soy products. <clears throat> so now that I've talked a little bit why, why we're focusing so much on soybeans, um, I've talked to you a little bit about, about the, the biology side of it, the, the microbiology side of it. Um, so these bradyrhizobium live in the soil uh, and, and when you have a plant, uh, you have a seed that's germinating, um, they're going to be expending some oils and, and, and kind of uh, sprouting and, and kind of putting out these flavonoids, right? So flavonoids are kind of a, a chemical communication molecule for the plant. Um, so they're kind of exuding these into the rhizosphere as they're growing. Um, and then if there is a compatible rhizobia partner uh, that can identify this, uh, this flavonoid, they look at it as food and then they, they, they eat that food up and then they secrete their own uh, chemical uh, signaling molecules, which are called uh, lipochidooligosaccharides, um, more, easily def more easily said as nod factors. Um, so those are secre <clears throat> secreted in response. Um, now the key here is it's a very uh, it's a very host specific manner. So so certain rhizobium produce certain nod factors to to form symbiosis with certain legumes. So here I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, soybean and Brady rhizobium. Um, that's kind of the the ideal uh, symbiotic partners. Um, there are many others that follow other uh, other trends though. So but but I'm going to be discussing Brady rhizobium and, and soybean just here. So the chemosensory pathway that, that, that these flavonoids and, and nod factors uh, start, they initiate a transcriptional cascade in host and symbiont. <clears throat> so if you imagine uh, one Brady rhizobium here by the root, by the root hair, uh, this Brady rhizobium produces this nod factor, which causes root hair curling, where the root actually curls and traps the organism into the root hair. Um, then you're going to see a localized breakdown of the root cell wall and then have an infection thread of the organism that actually infects the root cortex of, of the soybean plant. Uh, once inside the plant or once inside the root cortex, the bacterium pro proliferates and divides and actually differentiates into a bacterioid. So it's a, a slightly different state than a free living bacterium. So it's kind of interesting that, that they kind of they partner up with the soybean and then kind of shed some genes. They say, hey, I found my niche. This is where I belong. I don't need all that other stuff. I don't need to live out in the soil. I can, I can just live here. Um, so that's, that's kind of where their, their, their end goal is. And that's where biological nitrogen fixation occurs. So this, this biological nitrogen fixation uh, occurs using the nitrogenase enzyme. So it's a two enzyme complex uh, that is actually really energetically costly. Um, so if you remember, I said with fertilizers, it takes a lot of energy to break that molecule, uh, to break that dinitrogen molecule. And, and it, just like it does in, in the bacterioids, uh, it takes about 16 ATP, very energetically costly. However, that's what they're there for. Um, so uh, one really cool thing about this whole process 
is oxygen rapidly deactivates this two enzyme complex. So, so if you can see here, here's nodules. Um, these are actually our TXVA nodules. Um, here's a section of them. It almost looks organelle-like. It almost looks like like a, a liver. You can see that red, the, the blood in there. And that's a molecule called leg hemoglobin. So it's actually very, very chemically similar to the hemoglobin that's in our blood. And it serves the same purpose. Um, it sequesters oxygen, um, in this case, to make a microoxic environment so that nitrogenase can fix nitrogen. Um, and that is actually one of the main ways that a plant regulates its nodulation. Um, as I said before, it's host specific. So if the plant has uh, an infection that it recognizes as not being a symbiont, uh, in other words, if there is a hitchhiker or a non-nitrogen fixing rhizobia that somehow beats the defenses and gets in and, and forms these nodules, uh, it's, all it's doing is, is kind of a parasitism. It's stealing the nutrients from the plant, from the photosynthates and all the sugars and not returning any nitrate or nitrogen in return or ammonia. And uh, so then the plant can say, okay, well, hey, this, is not, this, this nodule is not giving me any kind of anything in return. So it can, it can kind of drown it out. Um, it can either change the oxygen levels in the nodule, which causes an abortion of the nodule, um, or it can just uh, kind of kind of stifle the uh, uh, kind of stifle the the bacterium itself and prevent it from taking any photosynthase. So that's one of the big regulators of control. Um, so I've told you, you know, microbial inoculants will aid in reducing the negative impacts of fertilizers. Um, so problem solved, right? Uh, I wish, you know, nothing is ever that simple. Uh, you know, when you take it out into the field, stuff happens. Um, in Texas heat happens. So rhizobial biological nitrogen fixation is strongly inhibited in arid soils due to the poor survival of rhizobia under the desiccation or heat stress. And not only are, are the bacterium just, they dry out, they're killed. Um, however, it really reduces the water potentials in the soils so that any of those flavonoids or, or, or uh, nod factors can't be relayed properly. Um, and then even if it does form the symbiosis, uh, the plant can't maintain the, the feedback of sugars and, and, and nitrogen uh, because that, that water potential is just not there. Thus, a desiccation tolerant inoculant could optimize symbiotic efficiency and aid crop production. So our goal for this experiment was to isolate a desiccation, a desiccation tolerant bradyrhizobium strains and test them in their capacity to increase soybean production. Uh, so the strategy that we went out to do this uh, we designed a molecular marker system um, to, uh, to run across a bunch of isolates that we have uh, to determine their desiccation tolerance. So then once we find some that have intrinsic desiccation tolerance, then we'll take them back out into the field, inoculate some soybean plants with them, measure all the physiological characteristics we can, and then ultimately determine, determine the economic return of that inoculant. Um, and we can do this in different regions um, and then provide the farmers in those regions fact sheets on, uh, uh, and information on the inoculants. Uh, a lot of farmers, uh, if they do know anything about inoculants, they don't know the details of inoculants. So, so really educating our farmers on, on how to uh, better create a sustainable agricultural approach is, is our main goal here. <clears throat> so the molecular marker system that we have, we used Brady Rhizobium Japonicum USDA 110, which is the model organism in, uh, in the symbiosis. Um, and we tested that under fully hydrated and then desiccated conditions. Uh, we ran a genome-wide expression study using a microarray, and we determined what genes were highly upregulated during desiccation stress. So these four genes we found were very highly upregulated under desiccation stress. Um, so we took uh, so we took these genes and developed QRT-PCR primers for each one of these to screen our isolates to see, okay, which one of our isolates has the highest amount of these genes being produced. Um, and if you look at these genes, three out of the four uh, are related with trehalose. So trehalose is a sugar. Um, it's a, what's called a compatible solute. So when drought happens, um, it's literally the physical removal of water. Uh, so when you have the physical removal of water from the soil, 
the solute concentration in the soil is going to go up and that's going to rob uh that's going to rob H, the rob water from the organisms that live in the soil um, and if those organisms can't produce some kind of compatible solute to stabilize their membranes then then they're going to die so so this is not surprising we see a lot of triolose in uh in mosses and algae especially those that that, that will be away from water for a long time and live on rocks. Um, so, so this is this is not surprising in that we found these genes, but it's very important that we did. Um, isocitrate lyase is is just a, a metabolic trick that it can subvert the TCA cycle and and use a, a less strenuous uh, metabolism to to get energy. So what we did was we uh, ran all of our isolates. We had thousands of isolates from soybean fields all around the nation. Uh, we ran isolates against these QRT PCR primers, and we determined which ones had the highest amount, uh, which ones had the highest upregulation of these genes. Um, so here we show three. Uh, and then we did some survivability experiments to determine, okay, these show that they have the genes. Now let's see if they can reflect that in their life state and in their lifestyle. Um, so at four hours, we can see some increase in survivability. Uh, but you see the real increase at the 72 hour mark. Uh, and that, that's gonna be representative of severe drought. Um, but the key here is just because it's desiccation tolerant does not necessarily mean it's going to fix nitrogen at an optimum level, right? So it can survive in the environment, but will it increase the yield? Um, so to do this, to figure this out, uh, we did a lot, of, uh, a lot of preliminary field trials. Um, so the first three years of field trials occurred in 2016 to 18. Uh, they were held at Rio Farms, Inc. in Monte Alto, Texas. Um, it's actually way down in the tip of Texas, right across the border of Mexico. Um, it's one of the southernmost soybean fields in the nation. Um, and and uh, this research was started by a previous grad student in my lab, uh, Dr. Dylan Parks, uh, who is now actually a professor here at the university. Um, so the first two years, we did small scale experimental plots. Um, these were hand planted, hand, or hand sampled and hand harvested, um, or about a thousand plants per plot. And, and it's really just to see, okay, so it works in the lab, but can we take it into the field and will it create a better yield? Um, and then our, our, our last year at, uh, down there in Rio Farms was our first commercial size plot. Um, this is the first year that I joined the program, um, and it was about 29 acres. Um, so we did have uh, some randomization here. However, this was not a, a, a randomized complete block set, uh, but it was just our first commercial size plot. So we said, let's let's see let's see if we can make it work. Um, so some of our some of our data from the first three years. Um, keep in mind, this was hand harvested. Uh, the first two years were hand harvested. So we have seed number per plant. That means we took each individual plant, counted the beans, counted the soybeans on each plant, how many beans per pod, very tedious work. Um, thank you for all of the undergrads that helped us. I was an undergrad that was helping on this research myself. So uh, tedious work, but it, but it, but it was done. And uh, the first year in 2016, we saw increases in the seed number for all three strains that we had isolated. Um, and this is as compared to a no treatment, uh, the USDA 110, which is the model organism, and then Celtec, which is a, uh, a, the mainstream commercial inoculant that's used typically. Um, then in 2017, we extended the trials to be uh, more of a variety test. Uh, and we did include some Rio Farms isolates that we got from that region, just to see, hey, maybe it's a regional thing. Maybe if we isolate some regional rhizobium there, then they're going to increase the, the yield because that's where they're from. Um, but, but we did not see that here. Uh, we saw our TXEA and VA strains uh, created the most, uh, the most seeds uh, for our yield. And you can see the cultivars here, Vernal and then two others. Uh, and Vernal definitely showed better promise than the two others. Um, and I think that's because Vernal is a variety that's typically used down there in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, so it's, it's, it's used to the environment there. Um, and in 2018, it was our first commercial size plot. And we have a fantastic yield from there. You know, about, about 11 bushels better than the no treatment. 
Um, you know, if you think about it, you have 100 acres, 11 bushels per acre more. I mean, that's a lot more. That's a lot more beans than you get for simply applying a, a, a topical inoculant. Um, however, that was not a randomized study. That was just our first control plot. So um, it's good work, uh, but we needed to extend it. Um, so not only that, but all three of these sites happen to generally the same location in the same region. So we said, okay, this is working, but will it work across regions? Uh, so that's where my field work came in. Um, I was fortunate enough in 2019 to be uh, the MSSB, so the Mid-South Soybean Board uh, funded our project um, so that we could plant across regions. Uh, so we have eight locations across seven different states. Um, I only have seven locations up here because our Rio Farms location down there that year um, was wiped out by a hurricane. Uh, so, so we did not see any sampling or yield from that. Um, but but we, have, uh, we have a lot of sites across many regions. They have varying soil types, which is really important um, because if it's very sandy soil, like it is out in North Carolina, uh, Sand Hills Research Station, then uh, the, the rhizobium don't live as well. They don't have as much organic material in the soil to, to persist. So, um, and they're very droughty. Uh, they drain really easily. And so it, the, the North Carolina site was a really good one to test because of the sand hills. Um, but, but then we also tried to keep the cultivar very similar across locations just to see, uh, uh, have some kind of constant. Um, however, in Texas and North Carolina, they're the extreme. So we couldn't use that cultivar there. Uh, so what I'm going to do, instead of discussing every single site in detail, which could get kind of tedious and boring, um, I'm going to discuss one site in detail, and then uh, everything was mimicked at every other site. Uh, I tried to keep variability to a minimum here. So, uh, so this is our Yoakum, Texas site. Uh, it's in collaboration with uh, James Grichar, who is at Texas A&M AgriLife Research. Um, see the Gulf of Texas down here. I think this is a really beautiful picture. Um, and this is actually us planting the field down in the left corner here. So at this site, we had three treatments with five replicates, uh, no treatment control, our TXVA uh, drought tolerant inoculant, and Celtec, which is our commercial inoculant. We had irrigated and non-irrigated conditions separated by a 50 foot spacer, 20 foot rows with five foot spacer rows, six rows per plot with 38 inch row spacing and 10 seeds per foot, which gave us a total plant stand of about 36,000 plants at this site. So the first thing I do approaching a site, um, I look at the soil complex. Um, if I'm going to Mississippi, I already know that I'm going to face a lot of clay soils. Um, if I'm going to North Carolina, our site there is very, very sandy. Um, you kind of generally have to know so that you know the seed depth. So in clay soils, you can't plant very deep because then the, the, the seed won't germinate and break the crust. Um, in sandy soils, it's the opposite. You can, you can plant as deep as you'd like because then, because it's just sand that the, the, the germination is occurring through. So it's really important to look at the soil profile before you go to the site. Um, here's, our, uh, here's a drone image of the site itself right before planting. If you can tell, there's kind of foot, footprints walked across here. You know, that's how we mark the plots. Um, we, uh, we, mark, we mark the rows like that just so the tractor knows where to plant. Um, here's a tractor we used. It's a Monosim vacuum planter. Um, this is not, was not kept constant at all sites um, because every site has their own planting specifics. Um, in Texas, since uh, soybeans are not grown primarily, uh, we use corn planting equipment like this, um, but it works, so uh, that's what we used. Uh, one thing you really don't think about whenever taking uh, microbiology into the field is keeping a septic technique. Um, as you can imagine, it's kind of really difficult to, to keep things sterile when you're out in the field surrounded by dirt, surrounded by uh, animals, and, but you have, to keep, uh, you have to keep everything sterile to the best of your ability. Um, so here, between treatments, we disassembled the tractor, um, cleaned it with 50% bleach, triple rinsed it, and then cleaned it out with a compressed air cylinder. Um, 
did this to prevent any kind of cross contamination uh, from inoculants so that no inoculant would, the, the no treatment would not get an excess bonus from our TXVA inoculant. So sampling occurs about 10 weeks after planting. Um, at this site, we did six technical replicates from each replicate. Uh, that gave us a total sample size of 180 at this site. Uh, the metrics included, uh, the metrics I looked at were height, dry plant weight, the nodule size and number, and then the taproot nodule number. Now the taproot nodule number is really important, um, and that's something that I added in, in this research uh, because taproot nodules are very indicative of being on of, of the on seed application of inoculant. So if you can think about it, as a root is growing, it's spacing out into the soils around it. Um, so if if there is a, a nodule on the lateral root, then it most likely came from an indigenous rhizobia in the soil. Uh, versus if there's a nodule right on the main root, the tap root, then, then it mo more than likely came from the seed coat after planting. Um, so that's really a really good indicator of a uh, successful inoculant is the tap root nodule number. One thing that, that field work has taught me as a, uh, as a growing scientist is you're gonna mess up. So whenever we planted this site, um, it was a little bit wet, uh, so we went ahead and planted. However, uh, right where the irrigation pipe was, I guess there was a little bit of a slope. Uh, so a lot of those seeds did not sprout. They did not come up. Uh, when you have waterlogged soils, uh, not only is it uh, uh, oxygen deprived, but it's also preventing the plant from germinating. It's preventing the seed from germinating. So it, it, it kind of stifles the seed and, and doesn't allow it to come up. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't use those to sample. Um, we were able to save them for harvest. So that is a good thing, but uh, you live and you learn. Uh, so for plant height, we took height to the highest flowering node. Um, that's uh, my coworker, Sarbjeet Narala. Um, he was out there helping me. Uh, he volunteered to come help. Uh, un unfortunately, he volunteered to come help. Uh, we spent about 11 hours out in the sun that day, so it was brutal. Um, but, but he began a project here as well, um, taking soil samples from each plot so that uh, he could determine the metagenomic content uh, and compare that with the uh, soil physiochemical co uh, content. So here is Sarbjeet and uh, one of our undergrads, uh, Mary Asmati. Um, they took six technical replicates from the outside rows, just like I did uh, from my sampling. Uh, the metrics they looked at were physiochemical data from each plot and then metagenomic content of the bulk soil as well as the rhizosphere soil. So bulk soil is gonna be more inner row soil between the rows, whereas rhizosphere is, exact, is right in the, the plane where the roots are. Um, so you can see Mary over here with a paintbrush, a uh, very tedious work of brushing the dirt off, uh, brushing the soil off of the roots and, and extracting uh, DNA from there and seeing what, who is really there, who are, who are our major players here. Are, is our inoculant affecting the microbial community there? Um, you know, I'm not here to talk about his project. It's an ongoing research project. Um, but, but that's just one of the things that, that research does is he came to help me and I was able to help him with his project. So it was really, really nice collaboration there. Um, you can see here I have a PCA. It's a principal component analysis plot. Um, it determines relatedness between whatever values you feed into the system. So here we have fertilizer levels. Um, and then we put all of our irrigated and non-irrigated treatments in. Um, and if you can see... There's not a perfect separation, but there's a lot of red up here and then a lot of green down here. So we do see some separation in our irrigated and non-irrigated samples. Um, so that's good, uh, but this is just an example of, of one of the physiochemical analyses that we're doing for each site. So getting into the data, um, mid-harvest vitality, we look at plant height and then the dry weight. Um, we don't really see too much. Um, however, it's some of the only physiological characteristics we can look at. Um, so what you do see the differences in is the nodule counts. Um, so up top, we have our TXVA strain, 
as you can see, there is copious amounts of nodules. Um, in the middle row, we have Celtec, which is our commercial inoculant. And then on the bottom, we have our no treatment. Um, looking at the counts, it's just night and day difference. Um, our, our, our total and the taproot counts, which is indicative of, of successful inoculation. Um, so, so I think this is really representative of, of how well our treatment works. But once it comes down, uh, once, when you're talking to farmers, it comes down to, all it comes down to is the final yield. So looking at, the, so looking at our harvest, um, here this site is kind of an outlier. We typically, used, uh, we typically used combines to harvest. However, at this site, we didn't have a combine, so we had to do hand harvesting. Um, this is our collaborator, uh, uh, James Grichar, and we did two standard lengths of a bar with a head, well, we just cut them with hedge, tripper, or a hedge, clip, hedge clippers. Um, and this is me and my girlfriend out in the field collecting the samples and bagging them up. Uh, my girlfriend may hate me for this, but, but she is such a great help. She will come out in the field and help me harvest and help me sample. And it's very hot and very miserable. So I really appreciate any help I can get. Um, so after sampling, uh, after the harvest, on this right side here, you can kind of tell there's, they're, they're more brown in appearance. There's not a lot of weeds in the row versus this, where it's, the, the stems are still green. Um, and there's a lot of weeds. And you can even see this in the, the drone image. So this top site right here, there's lots and lots of weed pressure. Whereas in the non-irrigated site, there's not that much weed pressure at all. Um, that's just goes to show that there is some separation in our treatments. Uh, so looking at the yield, um, irrigated, we don't see much of an increase. Um, it is a little bit better, but, but, but not much. Um, but then in the non-irrigated, you, you see the real increase. Um, so we have some, some statistical significance here. Um, now you say, okay, well, maybe one or two bushels isn't that much. However, when you're looking across uh, hundreds of acres, as, as a lot of commercial farming operations are, uh, one or two bushels can make a difference. And, and when it boils down to it, uh, if the input for the inoculant application is not that much, then, then the return on that, that application is, is gonna be even more. So that's what we're looking at here. So as I said, um, the planting, sampling, and harvest protocols were maintained at each of these sites um, to the best of my ability. Uh, sometimes stuff happens, uh, that's what happens with field work. Uh, for instance, in, uh, at our Arkansas site, uh, there was a tropical storm coming in and the collaborators there said, hey, uh, we can't get your stuff out of the fields. I'm sorry. Uh, if you can come get it, then, then you should come get it. Uh, so uh, Sarjeet and I loaded up and we drove out there. We got there at one in the morning and the rain was supposed to start at 7 a.m. So we said, you know what, let's just do it. So we harvested overnight and we got our results. Uh, we got out of there. We were literally packing up the car as the, the rain started. So, so uh, I, I really appreciate his help on that. Uh, but I wasn't gonna let Mother Nature take a, take a site that I had worked hard on. Um, so going to our yields, this is a summary of all of our yields for 2019. Um, in the non-irrigated condition, five out of seven plots showed an increase. And in the irrigated condition, we had four out of seven show an increase. Now, the two sites that don't show any increases, um, Clarkton, Missouri, and Stoneville, Mississippi. Uh, Clarkton, uh, in Missouri, they have a very, very rampant issue with uh, off-target spraying of dicamba. Uh, that may be one of the reasons that the EPA has, made, has banned that substance and made it illegal. Um, however, it, as they did make it illegal, but, but they are still allowing the farmers to use whatever stocks they have of it. Um, so, that severely stunts the plant growth unless you have dicamba resistant beans, which, which we did not. So, um, and then in Missouri, and then Mississippi, uh, it's just very, very fertile. You can see both of the inoculant treatments didn't even come close to the, the no treatment. And that's just kind of indicative of, of the levels of rhizobium that they have in their soil. Um, they've been growing beans there for, for hundreds of years. Um, so, so I think, uh, not seeing any kind of results there just shows that they have very fertile soils. Um, so going on to this year, uh, 
we increased our sites. Luckily, we were able to keep some of the commercial sites down in South Texas. Um, and then we also increased cultivar. So we said, you know, okay, our, our inoculant works. Uh, now, can we team it up with a cultivar with a variety of soybean that we can then sell as an entire package to the farmer saying, hey, it's supposed to be a very drought prone year this year. Um, here is a drought tolerant inoculant with a drought tolerant strain, uh, with a drought tolerant cultivar of, of soybean. So we have a USG and an S14, which are drought sensitive and Woodruff drought sensitive. Um, and then we have S14 or S11, which is drought tolerant. Uh, so we selected these at certain sites um, and, and it, it's, it's kind of crazy because if you think, okay, well, we're, let's, just, let's just add one variety. Well, if you had one variety, you have to add the replicates. So you're essentially doubling your plot with every variety you have. Um, so it's exponentially more work, but, but I think it's definitely necessary and, and the results are definitely turning out to be good. Uh, so I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna kind of touch on one site and then, and then show a couple others. Uh, so this is the same Yoakum, Texas site with uh, James Grichar. If you notice, last time we planted up here. Um, this year we planted down here. So we changed locations. And that's something that's really important because you don't want to use a field that had typically had inoculant applied to it, just in case there is some kind of carryover. Uh, so you want to use uh, virgin soils as much as possible. Um, at this site, we had three treatments with four replicates and three cultivars. Um, the cultivars used here were Otonio, which is a cultivar just like Vernal that's typically used down in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, CZ5515, which is a commercial variety made by Bayer. Uh, then TN16, uh, which is a line we used last year. Uh, we used two rows per plot with 38 inch row spacing, 10 seeds per foot, which left us at a total plant stand of about 22,000 plants. Um, sampling, which usually occurs around 10 weeks, uh, we did six technical replicates from each replicate, which gave us a sample size of 216. The metrics looked at were dry plant weight, nodule size and number, and taproot number. Um, and, and this just may be me nerding out, but I love looking at variety testing from the air. You can tell the varieties. Remember the, the, uh, the Atonio variety I said? And they're just so bushy and, and, and vigorous growth. Um, and that's because it's typically grown in that region. Uh, so it's really beautiful to look at the, the different varieties from the sky. Um, and I don't have uh, complete nodule counts uh, put in yet, but, but the first thing you do when you go to a site is go out and dig up some plants and see, and, and see if you see nodules. Um, so that's what I do when I first get to every site. Uh, I go out and dig up a plant from each treatment and say, okay, are there nodules there or are there none? Uh, so just from general appearances, uh, our strain does have better nodulation and the counts are reflecting that even though they're not complete. Um, the, the data that I do have complete for this site is the plant dry weight. And it's really interesting to look at this spread across cultivars um, with Atonio being the one that is typically grown in that region. And you can see that our TXVA inoculant works better with that. Um, you know, that could be our inoculant TXVA was isolated in Victoria County, Texas. Um, or it could be that Atonio is a little bit of a drought sensitive strain uh, where our uh, drought tolerant inoculant could make up for that and allow the, the genetics of that plant to really succeed. Um, so this really, really just shows the the promise of the variety testing that we're gonna be doing, that, that I'm completing this year. Um, and here I have a, a video that I've attached. This is from our Missouri site. Um, so keep in mind what I had said before, uh, you cannot plant anything in Missouri without being hit by dicamba. Um, it's off target drifting, but, uh, but the front rows and then the border rows are all dicamba resistant. So that's why you can kind of tell they're, they're more vigorous, they're larger. Uh, but barring that, we have, we have three varieties in here with six replicates. So this is our most extensive site. Um, and you can see the first four rows here are the TN16. And then the next four are drought, uh, drought tolerant strain, uh, the drought tolerant cultivar. 
and the next three are the drought sensitive cultivar. And when you look at it from the sky, you can, al you can almost pick out every single drought tolerant plot because the, the, they're, so, they're, so they're so flush, they're so vital. Um, so I just, I, I, I nerd out about this. I spend too much time in the field on my drone looking at this from the sky, but, but I just, I, I love seeing a, a site that is well managed and taken care of like this. So uh, because, because this was one of our more extensive sites, luckily I was able to spend more time here and I did get extensive sampling here. So I'm really excited to start looking at that data. Uh, another really exciting thing about this year is uh, the commercial testing that we're doing. So uh, this top left farm, uh, it's a Johnson farm. So we have collaborations with, uh, uh, with people down there who own these commercial farms. And basically they allow us to do testing and we give them free inoculant. So uh, this is a 24 acre split plot. Um, the Fike farm was a little bit more randomized. So every 18 rows, it alternates uh, from a commercial treatment to our TXVA treatment. Um, and I, I, I wondered myself, why was it every 18 rows? Um, I guess uh, the combines are typically nine row combines. So in order to keep uh, your replicates separate, you should do 18 rows so that you can do two passes and then weigh that and you can use that as your comparisons. Um, the most important site that I, that I have to show you today is, is our Vanderpool farm. Uh, so it's a 30 acre split plot. And this is the exact ground. This is the exact type of farm that we are, are targeting our inoculant towards. Um, uh, virgin soils. Soil that has had no history of soybean production. So there is very little, if any, natural rhizobium in this soil. Um, so, so you can tell the vitality of, of, of our TXVA treatment versus the commercial treatment. Um, it's just night and day difference. And that's the, I, once I put the drone up in the air and saw that picture, it was just, it was stunning. I mean, it's an eight and a half hour drive to get down to McAllen, but hey, it was worth it for that. So some of the future work that we have ahead, uh, finished sampling. Um, I'm actually going out to um, Yoakum, Texas tomorrow to finish our harvesting for this year. Uh, then data analysis from all the results. Uh, then take the results from this year and last year and do some multivariate analysis across sites, uh, factoring in um, the weather, our irrigation cycles, uh, all, uh, all of those variables that we can consider and try and determine what really creates the success of our inoculant. Um, not only that, but, but this year I started my, uh, I started my PhD. Uh, so I've really been refining the inoculant formulation to better increase survivability. Uh, what kind of additives can I add in there? Um, what kind of osmoprotectants? Anything to make it stick to the seed coat? Uh, what can we do to formulate our inoculant so that it works better, so that it lives longer? Um, and then last but not least, do some whole genome sequencing of our TXVA inoculant. Um, genetically, we see, we see the, the, the increase in yields, uh, but, but what all is that coming from? Uh, are we going to find some more drought, uh, some drought tolerance markers? Um, is there something that we're not even imagining? Is there some kind of nitrogen fixation complex that, that is optimum in our strain versus others? Is there uh, some symbiotic, symbiotic pro principles? Is there uh, microbial, microbial community interactions that we can look at that, that increases the yield uh, versus just our inoculant? Um, so, so really looking into the genetics of that is, really, is going to show us some really cool stuff. Um, but with that, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Chang and uh, the UTA Department of Biology for their mentorship and support. Uh, my lab members, past, present, and future, to, for discussing the nuances of this research with me time and time again. Um, and I want to say thank you to my family and my loved ones that lend an ear to my frustrations and panic attacks, and especially to my friends that have came and helped me in the field. I really appreciate it. Working in the fields for 10 hours is miserable, but it's, it's, it's worth it whenever, whenever I'm shown love like that. So um, I'll take some questions. If, if anybody doesn't get to their questions or anything, then don't hesitate to shoot me an email, uh, connect with me on social media. Um, uh, you know, I, we, can, we can definitely talk about anything. So 